Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. We're back today with an old friend of the channel, uh, Benny from Red Fox Labs. He's been on the channel uh, several times now talking about Komodo, Red Fox Labs. These guys are a sort of gaming incubator in Southeast Asia. You know, I've been talking about games a lot on the channel recently. Uh, these guys were one of my best projects in gaming, which we covered over a year ago. So today we're going to be talking all about that, what they're up to in the world of NFTs, some of the partnerships they've got. Uh, you'll notice I've got things like Wax up here and Rootstock, which is the Bitcoin uh, smart contract layer. So this is all going to tie together. It's going to be a fantastic chat. So thanks for joining us, Benny. Thank you for having me. Yeah, always I... good to uh, talk to a fellow Aussie. Absolutely. You guys have been up to so much, which which I love, and it's good to see those projects almost coming full circle and getting the recognition they deserve. We're also going to talk about how some of these good projects aren't even on the mid-tier exchanges yet, and that's all kind mm. of changing. We might even talk about IEOs and that, that cycle and how we're sort of seeing that all again. But uh, maybe for people that haven't followed your work at all or, or watched any of our yep. interviews, because I think we've probably doubled in size since we last spoke, do you want to give people, the, I guess, the quick version of your background and relationship with Komodo mm -hmm. then Red Fox Labs? Yeah, sure. So um, my background is mainly uh, turnarounds. I've, I've worked 12 countries all around the world doing um, turnarounds for large unicorn companies, multinationals, um, basically contracts, uh, work for Virgin, Oradu, Grab uh, in C-level positions. Um, and then went across to Komodo a few years ago, thought uh, much the same as you did. I thought blockchain's got a bit of a future, looks all right. Um, and I wanted to get involved in one of the more technical projects. So I went across and became GM of Komodo because they had the full end-to-end -end platform and the whole decentralized vibe of being much more like Satoshi's uh, original vision. Um, and then what I worked out was that uh, Komodo was kind of like Linux, open source, open platform. And what uh, Linux had was a red hat. So we decided to do Red Fox. Uh, and Red Fox is a venture builder and we um, moved to Southeast Asia because that was the fastest growing region. So uh, mainly Aussies um, started started it. We're uh, based here in Vietnam now and have actually even got a joint stock company here in Vietnam as well. So we're fully set up and uh, as Vietnamese as a, as a foreign company can be. Um, so that's really good. So we've uh, the background now is that uh, being a venture builder, focusing on the digital economy and digital inclusion, We've been focused on uh, e-commerce, um, e-media, which includes the gaming, um, also e-travel, and then all, and then the last part was the ride-hailing transport. But that's really been uh, huge into the um, in the region already. So we're really focusing on the finance side, gaming, um, and and high take-up rate streaming, and uh, um, yeah, we'll do, we can talk about that. So high take-up rate streaming and cashbacks. Yeah, I think. I might link the previous interviews down below for people, but some of the things we spoke about in those episodes were the, I guess, adoption, innovation, mm. even things like tax rules and, and just incentives mm. for startups and why so many Aussies have moved to places like Southeast Asia. But just the growing mm. population, um, the, the youth, the mobile adoption, there's just all this sort of mix mm. of factors there, uh, isn't there? And I guess that probably hasn't slowed down in the past 12 months since we last spoke. Oh, it's exceeded expectations. And even Google Tamasek, uh, they bring out a report every year, um, the SEA report, and they have to justify there and um, really talk about why they claim where they think the markets are going to go. And every year they have to backpedal and say, oops, we have, to, we have to put that projection right up. This is unprecedented growth. But you're talking about a region in Southeast Asia that only has 40% um, of its population in the digital economy. Uh, and you've got you've got hundreds of millions of people between the ages of 18 and 34. I mean, this is like, uh, this is massive. And um, this is why we're here, because as I think I might have mentioned to you last time, what happens is people still go into a bank, sit on a blue plastic chair, pull a number, wait for hours, speak to a, uh, a loan officer, for example, fill out a, a paper form, go away, and then get told a week later whether they have got their loan or not, um, we're, we're trying to uh, just shake those things up and, and promote digital inclusion and make it so that uh, we open up those financial doors for people. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone of our audience is probably pretty well up to speed with the idea of becoming your own bank and mobile adoption mm. and, and DeFi. And I know you guys are getting into that world of DeFi. It's on the roadmap as well. 
um, when you say that 40% stat, I, I'm assuming that 90% or more of people in that age bracket now have some sort of smartphone, but they're not in the digital economy. So is that just because of the labor and the jobs that are currently available? And that's why it's a fast growing area. And do you see that number getting you know up towards some of the, I guess the adoption rates we see in other countries and everyone is, I guess, in the digital economy in America when they're using yeah. Amazon and how's that all playing out over the next 12 months or so? Oh, it's gone berserk even since we've been here and uh, that's what's taken us so long to really get going and get products out as well because the market here is very difficult for foreign companies to do businesses new uh, to do business and you talked about how some of the uh these countries have opened up the doors and made it easy to do business and that's true vietnam is still one of the ones that can, is considered to be a little trickier okay. uh so for us to get a joint stock is, is almost impossible but uh, the reason I think it is as well is because you need to have um, so much go through so much of a process of the KYC and the onboarding, uh, and it is a very antiquated system. It is changing rapidly. Like two years ago, there was almost no food delivery or anything here, and now um, it, it's gone berserk because you've got uh, with the grabs and the, the likes, the Uber equivalent here in Southeast Asia, they're big on bikes, obviously motorbikes. So these guys double very well as uh, food delivery. Mm. So all of these food delivery apps have popped up now. Um, everybody knows them, everybody uses them. They've got their own chat apps um, and they've, they're equivalents to WhatsApp. Uh, so it's, it's really starting to happen for sure. And as you say, the younger percentage of population are really switched on and engaged, uh, but the older generation still have like feature phones, uh, not even smartphones. Yeah. Again, do you want to maybe give people the short version because we spoke about this in great detail last time, this idea of um, copying tech or what's mm. culturally, I guess, accepted because we see the US versus China IP wars mm. and Trump's trying to ban TikTok and then Microsoft will say and Facebook, oh, well, yeah. we'll do a copycat. You just said then in that sentence, and I'm sure everyone at home was waiting for you to say Uber and you say you know, the equivalence. So how does that work? And that's almost one of your um, parts of the business that you really based it all around, wasn't it? Making those clones or copycats. Mm -hmm. Should I talk about all that? Yep. Yeah, so Grab uh, Grab's a 14 plus billion dollar company. It's the uh, biggest uh, home growing unicorn in the region. Um, so uh, look, the, the thing is, we, when we said we wanted to do Venture Builder or Startup Studio, uh, there was no better place for us to look at because people said, ah, oh, they're just going to copy Amazon or Google or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, um, good luck doing that without any money. And how are you going to how are you going to be able to um, copy what they do? The idea of it is to take the core essential um, uh, business model and say, where doesn't it exist? And if it doesn't exist in one of these countries, so we've got a very strict nine point funnel system. So we say, if we're not second to fifth to market, or there's two companies that have 80% market share that we can aggressively take, uh, become an attacker brand and take market share from, can we, can we find the staff in the region that can actually scale this? Um, can the technology that we offer give us some sort of IP protection or some, and you might say that's weird, you're copying another company and yet you want to protect the idea. The idea, the base model of the idea, you can't just copy and try and catch one of those companies. You've got to innovate and go ahead of them, which is why we're looking at all the emerging techs. Mm. But the weird thing is, and people don't understand that from outside the region, we're far more likely, and we are, copying the Chinese companies more so than the Americans. The reason being, these guys know how to scale 10 times faster. They're very, very lean, aggressive in their growth structures. And that's what these regions need. You see the TikToks, you see the Alibabas and the Tencents. These companies are, um, they've got massive audiences. They know how to appeal to them. They know how to get everybody on board. And we're trying to do the same in Southeast Asia, which is sort of obviously next door to China, um, Vietnam at least. And uh, things that, that have been going there for four or five years and are proven are only just starting to come here now. Mm -hmm. So um, the copycat model works very well, but you can't just straight copy. You've got to copy the base idea and you've got to innovate and you've got to provide some sort of tech that gives you an edge or advantage. Otherwise, you're dead in the water. And it's just the sheer numbers, as you say, for an, an app in China that wants to go from startup to 25 million users in a year, you know, that's every person in Australia. That's the sort of numbers yeah. that we're talking about that happen. And you hear stories about that in Asia. Yeah. I mean, um, I lived in a city when I was a CEO of a company in China. I, I got to choose where I lived and I lived in Chengdu. 
And Chengdu had uh, somewhere between a 12 and 15 million population, and people were saying, "I've never heard of it. <laughs> I, I don't even. I've never even heard of the city, and it's and it's you know two thirds the size of of Australia, uh, their population, and it's one city. These. I don't think anyone has any idea how deep the well goes just in Southeast Asia alone. And if you look at Grab, uh, Grab have uh, determined that they are not ever going to go outside of Southeast Asia because the market is so deep and so young in its formation that there's no reason for them to do that. And uh, just like us, if you build large scale communities, the ability to switch on the DeFi model and the financial model is really, really, really much easier because you just, you've got a captive audience, you've got an audience that uses you every day. It's really, really easy to flick that switch. Almost, um, I guess a good comparison for people at home, it's almost like Facebook having all these users and then integrating Facebook pay or whatever they're going to call it and just make yep. it a, a one-click button. In China, you've got your WeChats and, and that. And in Southeast yep. Asia, you're trying to fight for that market share of mobile and then just add yep. from your food collection to, to loans and, and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. So um, is there any difference in terms of the, I know the population density, I think, mm-hmm. again, that's one of the maybe things that makes the digital adoption and the digital economy so attractive. But as we switch the conversation towards gaming as well, we don't have big soccer fields and guys being able to play cricket in their backyard or, or, or footy in mm-hmm. these wide open spaces. Is that a reason why you think gaming and digital is just more likely to take off there? I think, I think um, by culture, these guys uh, study very hard because the populations are, are very large and you uh, effectively it's easy to, I don't want to um, say anything in a derogatory way, but it's easy to become a number in a system. So these mm. guys have to really, and, and we know the parents push the kids really hard to study at school and um, to, to get ahead. And they this is a really quick switch off for them as well. If you're on your mobile, and a lot of these people will probably never have laptops or PCs, they'll, they'll do everything through their phone. Yeah. So it's a way to engage with people. It's a way to quickly transition from studying and learning and all the rest of it. It's a, it's a quick break for them. Um, and they love the tournament side of things as well. They love the gaming aspect because in Vietnam, they can't gamble. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, pent up competition. Um, they want that they play a lot of these online um, battle games, RPG yeah. and role playing games. Yeah. These, it's a it's a really um, it's a really interesting environment, and I mean the esports scene in this part of the world, uh, even it does even America doesn't have as much traction yet um, as as China and this. I mean these guys are superstars. These got the esport champions in China are are actually household names. Yeah. Um, this is this is uh, something that's definitely coming to to America for so- sure. So your main project at the moment or what you're about to release, um, I might just show people the, um, so this is Red Fox Labs. Uh, I will show you, so Wax is one of the, I guess, projects that I've spoken about a lot on the channel. I'll get you to talk about the relationship there between COGS and and Wax. Mm -hmm. But COGS is basically another one of these uh, NFTs, digital collectibles, really fun Mm -hmm. games that people are, I guess, well, adopting so quickly. I mean, look at Gods Unchained, little Aussie project that jumped to number one in terms of the volume it was doing of trading of all these different NFTs and cards. So do you want to talk about the relationship there between uh, Komodo and then Wax Mm -hmm. and now even Rootstock, which is the Bitcoin smart contract layer and how that's all Mm -hmm. playing out? Yeah, so what's happened is... um obviously we started building a game that was fully on chain and it took a lot longer than we thought because a people said why bother uh b people said how are you going to do it um so we did that as a proof of technology and it took a lot longer than we thought we had to uh, make sure it was fast scalable secure all the rest of it so you're not going to build a triple a game on on chain at the moment so yeah arc Liga, the um lead designer for H1Z1 and uh, Planet Side 2 came. Uh, he, he's a co-founder of Red Fox uh, Games or R Fox Games, of course. And and uh, he turned around and said, well, what if we did a digital version of Pogs? Uh, and Pogs, I think in Australia, it was called Tarzos. Yes. Uh, yes. So he said, why don't we do a v- digital ver- version of that? And uh, it's a simple slammer-based game. And what we can do uh, is is have these pieces and we can use them across a number of different games. So what we ended up doing was we called it COGS and it, with a K and it stands for keys to other games. 
So what it does is the NFTs allow you to unlock skins, weapons, tournaments across a series of games. So it's not just captive to one it's ecosystem. The, yeah, it's the idea of the metaverse that we've spoken about a lot on the channel mm. recently. Yeah. Yeah, and, and technically speaking, we're already mucking around with a couple of other um, companies, which we'll name in the next day or so, but one of them is the number one gaming app uh, around about nesting. Um, so putting things inside of the NFT, meaning you could actually take their NFTs and game items um, and you can either burn or redeem through the NFT that we have. So through our COG, you'll be able to unlock uh, packs, digital items um, through these COGs. So we're only just getting started, but uh, even if you look at the, the contracts that Link and some of these companies are writing, you can actually have event-based triggers inside of NFTs, meaning if you say, if Ronaldo scores a hat-trick on the weekend, we'll mint a limited edition NFT for anyone holding a particular NFT. I mean, we're only we're just in the very, very early stages, uh, and and you know, um, people have come to us with the concepts and ideas of, we've already got voxels, uh, crypto voxels. You've got art galleries and stuff. Yeah. You can actually have an NFT that is the art gallery that hosts and shows the NFTs, and everyone can buy a shard or a part of that NFT and take some of the profits of the actual art gallery, which is, it, it's just absolutely mind blowing. It's it's hard to. I know you've covered Decentraland and other projects. It's it's mind blowing what they're all doing. Yeah, and and similar concepts for people at home: fractional ownership of real estate, and now fractional ownership of digital real estate, like a digital art gallery that Benny just said. Uh, the streams and the possibilities, what you can do from all this, is, is mind blowing. But um, yeah, so you started building on. Komodo and now you know Wax have got their own blockchain. I know they're really trying to be interoperable with EOS. Everyone's trying mm -hmm. to be interoperable with Ethereum. And you already mentioned Decentraland and sort of their NFTs and those standards. Mm -hmm. So the standards interoperable with what you want to do and how does uh, Rootstock on top of Bitcoin tie into this? Yeah. So with Wax, um, Wax have just like uh, the, they've got their act together. They understand the digital collectible market. They understand. Uh, if you see what's going on behind the scenes, it's really quite amazing. They've got uh, Marvel, Disney, um, they've got uh, Animoca brands. Is it um, William Shatner that got on board as well? William Shatner. Uh, yeah. he, he, he was the one uh, two before us. So we, we go tonight actually with our NFTs, but um, they actually are very much the premier uh, you know, in the space for NFT. So we thought this was a really good opportunity for us to be able to go out and say, um, let's showcase interoperability and the fact that chains are prepared to work together. Uh, it is early days. Uh, we're back in the, the Atari or Commodore. Oh, Atari's on their board as well. Atari yeah. and Commodore 64. Uh, and where Wax uh, has a has a strong advantage is that they're only just now. Ours is one of the first. You have to buy in with the Wax um, token to be able to get into the sale tonight. So the thing is that they've. You know, you mentioned IEO in the beginning. They've just just started with the whole phase of uh, having real utility to their actual token. Um, so how it all ties in is the game, Komodo's tech's amazing and, it, and realistically it was the only tech that we could build the game 100% on chain. Um, and now we've built, we've uh, releasing the version of the NFTs on, on Wax, but the idea is to make all of this interoperable um, 100%. So that's, it's kind of, people have seen that tokens can be issued on two different chains. That, that's kind of all you really need to understand. The fact that an, an NFT, a non-fungible mm. token can exist on two different chains. Uh, what about the mm -hmm. Bitcoin rootstock side of things? Yep. Okay, so um, we're very proud to announce as of today that it's a, it's official that we're doing a, um, we've done an MOU with uh, a stock listed company. Uh, so, um, Coincilium and IOV Labs. IOV Labs is, uh, for anyone who knows the rootstock ecosystem, will know who IOV Labs is. Uh, they're massive in uh, South America as well. They've got a uh, border, uh, Turinga, which is like Facebook equivalent for, for Spain. They're doing heaps of stuff in DeFi, uh, as you probably know. Rootstock very heavily focused on DeFi and the bridge between and bridging um, the Ethereum smart contracts onto the Bitcoin platform, which they've now done. So today uh, we've announced that we'll be there, um, uh, an official partner, and we will help build with IOV Labs. Uh, it'll be called IOV Asia for, on Rootstock and for Rootstock. We'll end up being an educational hub, and we'll roll out all of their financial um, products in the Southeast Asian market. So we um, we will officially announce now that we are going fully fledged into that DeFi uh, DeFi realm as well, which was always the plan.
Awesome. And how does the Red Fox token tie into all of this? Because I guess it's similar. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, where does the value going to accrue? Is it to mm -hmm. Ethereum, for example, or is it the Mana token, or is it the mm -hmm. collectibles in that ecosystem? So how does the value with Red Fox Labs tie into it all? Yeah, so Red Fox, when uh, we release the, the full games and all the rest of it, because it'll be on chain, every single transaction has to be settled through our coin. So it doesn't matter what coin's used, it has to go through our coin to settle the, on, the on-chain transaction. So um, that's, that's a, a very, very big positive for us, obviously. But then we've got a cashback and streaming app, which is the first one we'll work with Rootstock on. Uh, that's been built, the app, so we just have to do the back end now. So we've, that's pretty exciting as well. So it's as I say, it's taken us a long time to get up and running. And it will seem like we're just overnight just going bang, but it's been a lot of work. But Rootstock will work with us and they've got the access to um, stable coins and all the rest of it. So I can't give away too much, but the fact is that um, we will have... Uh, we will have full access to uh, underlying stable coin um, and the, how the RFOX will come into play is anything that we're doing, um, RFOX will be the main underlying currency. So this is about to really, really have some utility across multiple businesses. Yeah, I was just bringing up the Rootstock website. Uh, there's the DeFi tab here. And then as soon as you click on that, they've got the RIF dollar. So that looks like that's going to be there, mm -hmm. you know, Rootstock stablecoin. Um, yep. The other thing I was kind of thinking was, you mentioned that wax tokens for the sales of these things uh in future mm -hmm. do you want red fox to be also one of the currencies for this i know some exchanges have gone mm. that model others like uh, ftx recently you didn't necessarily have to use their ftt token for an ieo so any thoughts on that mm. yeah i think that, that it's becoming more and more open and the fact that we were kind of um very happy to work with wax on this shows that it's about going where you're going to get adoption and where you're going to get users and these guys are ahead of the game on that side of things so um the the real thing for us is to make sure that we are we are interoperable and that we can work with multiple uh, and across chains and i mean um yes 100 percent uh we plan to have our fox driving everything um so the i think the thing is the partnership with uh rootstock is um absolutely uh, mind-blowing for us as well because uh, it's it's very rare that you'll get a a, a crypto-based project that's that's got a joint stock in another company does a partnership with a stock-listed company and uh, and then um, amalgamates to do uh, such a, a big job for um, for Rootstock. So we're very happy about that. We're very happy about the fact we'll get a lot of extra um, dev muscle. We'll be able to roll out a lot faster. And then having this massive network also through Southeast Asia that can flow into South uh, America as well means that um, we've just opened up a lot of doorways and I think it's a credit to the team for, for just the hard work put in. And um, as I say, it looks like these projects and a lot of the projects you follow, they put in so much blood, sweat and tears. They're trying to do the right thing and they look like they've done nothing for a long period of time and then suddenly they just go bang. Yeah. Um, and mean... this is our bang moment. Yeah, and a lot of them deliberately cut out things like marketing staff to save themselves 70 grand a year on a marketing manager because things were so tight in crypto winter. And now those projects and all the green shoots are coming out. So any thoughts on Bitcoin maximalism, Benny? Now you've gone down this path with Rootstock and smart contracts on Bitcoin and they're pushing for DeFi on Bitcoin. It's so interesting to me because you've got people like Samsung now that have been very vocal uh, Bitcoin maximalist, the you know head head honcho at uh, Blockstream, the controversial company, but now they've done an ICO and they've got a gaming token, and we're hearing stuff like tokens on Bitcoin, NFTs. So how's that? You know, it, it seems to me like it's almost bad if it's on Ethereum, but it's good if it's on on Bitcoin. And now you know they're working with Red Fox Labs and all this other stuff. So have you had any conversations that are awkward, or are they really open to this? Uh, well, we sort of, um, we go in with a pretty clear stance and it might not suit everybody, but that's what we love about, we loved about talking to IOV Labs and Rootstock and all the rest of it is that these guys get it. Uh, they said, you know, that they understand that if you want to grow and you want to actually get adoption, then you have to build high scale businesses that people are going to use. We can't roll out uh, low production value or low uh, interest types of projects or just jump to whatever sounds like it's a grabby, a cash grabby type of uh, cycle system or name. 
Uh, so I think that uh, a lot of people are starting to realize that Ethereum, regardless of, of what people think of it, it has the adoption and it has the network effect mm. uh, 100% and all the dApps are being built there. So if you can integrate um, and, and do bridges to Bitcoin, why would you not do that? Um, I don't think there's been any... Um, any weird conversations or stickiness or whatever. I think obviously for, for a company like us based in Asia, who's going to build high scale companies, I think every conversation we have is uh, how, how do they lock us in to try and build just on one network. Um, and uh, so our, our, our attention's not divided, but uh, we have, uh, as a venture builder, we have multiple businesses. So it's very easy for us to build out a different business on a different blockchain because they can't, there's no one blockchain that can do everything. No, and I think that's where the conversation has changed almost from 2017 or 18 when it was all about transactions per second or it was, you know, the Ethereum of, of China, the South Korean Ethereum. And now the conversation's changed to interoperability or something like uh, Solana recently, Near Protocol, these others that are saying, well, we can help mm. Ethereum, help scale it, and we're kind of a layer two or a bit of a side chain. Mm -hmm. And it's just that interoperability. Then you've got Cosmos, Polkadot. That's really an ecosystem of people working together versus this mindset of just closing everyone else off. And I think sometimes those people realize that you know, they're, they're really insulating themselves if you do that. You, this is billions of people that we want to adopt into this ecosystem that are going to be using different protocols and games. And at the end of the day, kids in Southeast Asia aren't going to be playing these games and thinking, oh, you know, I don't like it because it's not on this blockchain. They're not going to have any idea what's even going on behind the screen. I, I can tell you, I've worked in telecommunications most of my life and it was uh, America and Japan never really had the GSM when, when it was the global system for mobiles. There's always some sort of like lockdown, pro, uh, some sort of siloed uh, entanglement type of ploy. Uh, you know, Apple's very isolated. Yes. Uh, Android's very different. So all of these companies try and protect their market share. And, and as you know, when you're building a company, everyone talks about building a moat around it and making sure you can't be copied and lose your market share. We're in the early uh, days, and I know it's a horrible reference, but I always say we're swimming in the same pool of spit. And the thing is that you've got to actually try and uh, work with each other. And if you're really here to, uh, to push for adoption, um, you're better off to work with people that have made uh, you know, steady progress in a particular area. And as a venture builder trying to build out multiple companies, we work with emerging tech that's going to give us the best chance for, for getting that mass scale adoption. So um, I think maximalism is an interesting, I think it was probably more relevant a couple of years ago. And there's a lot of people uh, in the trading world that say, I only ever use Bitcoin and Bitcoin's king. Of course, it is the king, but Ethereum's got the network effect. And until something comes along and overtakes it, it's, it's number one as far as uh, having dApps built on it. Um, so ultimately speaking, I think you just have to uh, understand where you're going as a business and then uh, you've got to use what's best for, for that business's success. You can't, you can't just turn around and say, I'm only going to build on Ethereum. Um, yeah. You have to build what's going to be best for your business. And as you say, the kids in Asia, no one cares where their electricity comes from. Yeah. No one cares where no one cares where things are plugging into. They just care that it works and that it's affordable and it's and it does what it's supposed to do. Absolutely. So um, one of the shows we've been doing recently was uh, Nuggets Grill where we get these IEOs on. And look, I might even sort of take the conversation in that direction, even though it's not necessarily just focused on what you're doing. But um, the time I upload this uh, this afternoon, which is going to be uh, Tuesday in Australia, the sale you're doing. So how does that work? And if people sort of like this idea, like we spoke about before, is it the Red Fox token where you are putting some chips or should people be investing in buying some of these packs and the cogs like we've seen Gods Unchained and some of these super rares or crypto kitties exploding value or yeah, how, how would you see that and are you in sort of investing in this? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. And I mean, I think the IEOs, uh, if, you, if you want to be honest and um, I probably get in trouble for being too straight sometimes, but the fact is that the ICO craze was all about projects uh right and it was about getting huge amounts of money in for these projects to to launch and we had these ridiculously wealthy projects come out as a result of just the fomo and you know that they, they bring they brought in little uh things like you got a whitelist and if you could get lucky enough to get on the whitelist you could act as a broker to get other people in and it was like 
it was a big boom. And then the IEOs came and they, that was 100% for the exchanges. Mm. So the exchanges used that as PR. They took most of the money. They use it as uh, m- uh, market making and uh, all the rest of it. So that was the exchange movement. Now you've got NFTs coming into play and the NFTs are kind of, um, they're, well, at least on through the wax side, it's very small runs. Um, generally, they're around the 100,000 mark, but they've got something that actually back them uh, as far as you've got an item. Mm. Um, and and today, Wax has had just tradable cards and stuff, so we're, we're one of the first games to go. Um, so, so, yeah, as far as being invested and how does it all play out and all the rest of it, uh, this is very much for us a, a launch pad for our gaming network because we're going to have a number of different games. And then... Um, You've, you've got to look for product market fit and for, to make sure that you've got something that people want to use and want to adopt. And then then we can uh, work on that interoperability and, and um, doing it across the platforms. And for technical difficulties, I remember back in the ICO days when people had to get their head around how to use my the wallet mm. and sending crypto and gas fees. Uh, the other day, mm. FTX, for example, made it very easy for people on an exchange. I know that the EOS wallets and WAX wallets haven't been historically that friendly to use. So how is this working for a beginner that's sort of thinking, do I need to buy WAX? How do I send that in? Is that going to be technically difficult? No, WAX is like actually probably uh, the, the most impressive one that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, to get a WAX cloud wallet, for example, you just need an email address and a, and a password. So some people watching this will go, ugh, that's a terrible system. Um, but the fact is that uh, as we've seen, um, you, you have to look into the system behind it. But as we've seen, most people can't be uh, trusted to look after their own stuff. And you've always got the option to do that if you want, obviously, or you can have their, they've got like a, a custodial wallet. Yeah. Uh, but the fact is that it's extremely easy to to get into. The issue with it is that WAX is one of those, uh, it's not listed on Binance mm. and it's not on, a, it's not on uh, some of the bigger exchanges. So despite what it's actually doing, um, people do have issues in, in getting their hands on it. And uh, yesterday we announced, obviously, that we're, uh, um, we were talking, it's getting close to the sale tonight. And um, there's obviously been a, a bit of a demand for, for wax over the last 24 hours. And the, the price has gone up a little bit, um, people trying to get into the, to, to this sale. So I might bring it up. Um, I, haven't, I haven't looked at it, but um, it's, it's funny you say that. And then there was a chain swap uh a little while ago so some people have got the yeah. erc20 version and then that always is conf- yeah. always confuses people um i'll have to have a look at that new wallet but one of the things that a lot of these chains have spoken about is um the fact that there's like account recovery and things like that so um mm-hmm. i'm looking at the chart benny it's very choppy on some of these exchanges so not too much sure. action to be honest but um yeah some of those more centralized exchange uh protocols have made the decision for that email and password because they want mm. beginners to be able to recover their account if they lose anything and have sort of backup measures in place versus just losing your private key or hardware wallet and your words and it's all gone forever yeah i mean look at look at polka dot polka dot uh what did they lose 150 million <laughs> yes you have to either do a fork or you have to uh it's it's quite difficult so people sort of People uh, say, I want to manage my own funds and I want to uh, look after my own stuff. But then if they ever get in a situation where they lose their their money or they lose their access, they say, oh, this is no good. This is why it will never be adopted because there's no, there is no recovery. Yeah. So um, I can see both sides. Uh, I, I don't try and pretend that I'm um, one way or another. I mean, right behind us, we've got Satoshi's uh, white paper as a wallpaper. I mean, we believe in the principle. I believe in the, uh, everything to do with the decentralization, but it's just um, the certain aspects where it is advantageous. And if we want to do, if we want to bring in new people, and I think the trick is allowing people to have that custodial side of things with the easy login, but for those people who want to then access the keys and take control themselves and all the rest of it, that has to be an option. Mm, yeah, um, sure. So, so I, I don't think it's as bad as everyone said. And I know people will hold their nose and say, ooh, that's a, it, it's terrible and it's not what crypto is all about. Um, ultimately, we need adoption and we need people to come in. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of that conversation around exchanges, 
we've mm. seen the different extremes. So back in 2017 or 18, projects were paying you know a million dollars to get on Binance, mm. and uh, some of the stories we've heard about the second tier exchanges in particular that were keeping almost all the IEO money that was raised for mm. themselves and saying that no, that was just charged for marketing. You don't get to keep mm. that. Then the other end of the spectrum, recently we've had projects that have just been too hard to ignore. So you know Binance listing synthetics, and they've gone on a on a spree listing all these projects recently because that's where the trading and the demand is. So yeah, yeah sure. I guess that's the sort of scale. And for you guys, as you said, Red Fox isn't even really on any big exchanges and mm. liquidity is low. So are you hoping to go down that path of letting the tech speak for itself and getting on those next tier exchanges? And it's just too hard to ignore if you keep kicking goals. I think that also, um, depending on what happens with, uh, yeah, I, I've just got to be, um, I mean, you, you put two and two together and if, you, if you're going to be doing a hub here for, root stock and all the rest of it, um, there's, uh, I mean, yes, it's too hard to ignore and there will inevitably, we could end up being in a similar situation to WAX as well, where there's uh, multiple things going on. But um, obviously protocols uh, dictate exchange listings as well, but it's all about adoption. If you've got users, um, exchanges aren't stupid. They either go for users or, um, you know, of your product or large audiences because they want traders. Mm. So uh, now that we bring in a product and we announce these types of partnerships and we start doing bigger things, um, you can't ignore that anymore. But uh, we've been very choosy as well because most of these exchanges, uh, all the volume's fake and um, uh, most of them aren't regulated properly and they're going to get in big trouble in the next uh, year or two. So I don't want to pay three, four, five hundred thousand to get listed onto an exchange that's not going to be around in a year. Yeah, okay. Um, we're definitely seeing even like BitMEX having to do the KYC. I think we're kind of seeing all that coming, as you say, in the next 12 months or so. Um, Anything else to you wanted to talk about, Benny? I know it's kind of funny that we're in this alt season again, that IEOs have gone full circle. I mean, we, I think the last time we spoke about that, the good projects would make it out the other side when a lot of people were saying, we'll never see anything like 2017 again. And mm -hmm. I'd probably argue that it's going to be a bigger bubble. Now we've got Day Trader Dave, you know, talking about Link and then he pr promoted OXT last night. So it's almost just like history is repeating. It's almost crazy to think that some people haven't learned any lessons, but then you sort of sit down and think, well, the space was so small, there's probably tenfold the people going to come in and they haven't learned their lessons. And for them, this isn't history repeating. I think uh, you, you, there's two two parts to that. The first part is if uh, you're looking inside of the house, so to speak, everybody's saying, oh, alt season's coming and uh, we're in alt season and we're in a, a bull market. And then you open up the bl blinds and metaphorically speaking, you, you've got dead bodies lying in the street. You've got a, a pandemic. You've got mm. uh, record unemployment. You've got money printers going brrr, and you're thinking to your banks uh, having to, you know, banks are, are changing the way that they their rules work. You can't even deposit money in some of them it's just like you, you think to yourself hang on there's no alignment between what we think's happening and what the outside world's doing so that's the one that's the one real danger mm. second thing the second thing is like you say um it is going tenfold we've got a sort of uh we've got to sort of pick that adoption up and um before and and really get people to switch their focus towards this side of things and uh, against the traditional financing system before the, the bottom falls out of all of the markets uh, due to what's actually happening outside. So it's a very interesting situation. But I've always said since the beginning that um, I think we'd have one more really big push, uh, like one boom after 2017 that would dwarf it. And then I think what you'll do is you'll go through the same type of a dot com where uh, the, the really good projects get adopted and become the next mega companies in the world. Um, but you have to go through that major adoption and uh the blockchain you know look at ethereum and stuff where all the network effect and everything is gas prices are killing projects they can't they can't mm. uh, some of them can't exist unless they implement second layer solutions so i think it's a really interesting time right now and i'm being very quiet on what i think because of the fact that i don't think anybody knows but this market uh it just feels like it's it's headed the same way as 2017 but it also statistically and data wise it is propped up by nothing um in the sense that where's this money coming from um yeah i mean i i definitely thought at one stage that there's no way that we could have an alt season if you have a recession and people losing jobs and not getting higher wages but then 
look at the stats about the handouts and is Trump going to hand out another couple of trillion dollars? Mm. This UBI, basically the Fed have never been able to take away the punch bowl and now the government have got a punch bowl as well. I don't think they're going to be able to take it away. It won't be politically popular and then the incumbent will just promise more. So are we heading to this situation where people are just getting this UBI and speculating on Robin Hood or on altcoins? It's um, it's crazy to think, as you say, that unemployment could be at these record levels and yet everything could be going up. And that that is going to work until it doesn't and until there's pitchforks or whatever reason. But uh, yeah, that's why it's one day at a time and the world is a very interesting place at the moment. It's a race against the clock. If they can print enough to get us over the hump, then we're away. If they can't, um, we're in deep, deep trouble. So mm. it's really interesting to see. I think we're at a, at a real crux and a crossroad. And um, I think uh, anybody that tells you they know which way it's going to go is probably a little bit, um, yeah. you know, you, you, it's a thumb suck, isn't it, really? Yeah. But uh, we've never seen anything like this before in our lives. Uh, there's been no um economic situation that parallels this really so yeah um i don't don't know you can only go on experience yes well that's a good place to wrap it up i'll uh i'll put all the links down below to red fox labs wax rootstock um the the sale and the cogs and all that stuff guys so i hope you guys have enjoyed that something a little bit different um great to have you back benny and any final thoughts for people Oh, you're doing a great job. And I think um, looking at your audience and how you've grown it and you've grown it the right way as well, uh, that's also indicative of the people that are coming into the the space as well and what they're interested in. It's changed a lot. And I think Mm. you're doing a a wonderful job and you're putting Australia on the map as far as uh, the the blockchain side of things are concerned. So uh, well done. And um, it's always, always good to come back and talk to you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Benny. And I'm sure you guys are going to keep kicking goals over there in Southeast Asia as well. So we'll have to catch up again in the future. Okay, thank you, mate. See you. Cheers, guys.